are honored to have Dr. Gina Marcia Stewart as our very special guest on this African American Preaching Legacy Series. We are honored to have you. And so thank you so much for taking the time. This, I've been looking forward to this interview. Well, I'm glad to be here. And uh, I'm certainly honored by the invitation. I've seen the caliber of preachers that you've <laughs> uh, interviewed. And so I'm glad to be on the list. Oh, I'm glad that you included me. Well, first, thank you for being you know, a part of the PhD program. You are one of our brightest and best. We have such a wonderful cohort. You are part of that. Thank and you. we're just excited thank you. that you've chosen CTS to come and be a PhD in homiletics. Yes. And what we're most excited about, about you is that you already are you know, a doctorate in the practice, but the theory and, and you know, you, you, you're gonna be a dang, you can be dangerous. Let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> More dangerous than you already are. <laughs> you add a danger I'm to your danger. Hard. I'm no, working no. hard. <laughs> Called danger. I'm working hard. To your danger. <laughs> So, um, of course, a lot of people know who Gina Marcia Stewart is, but for the folk that do not know you, we have all kinds of international audiences that watch this. It's amazing. So, what would you like to tell someone that does not know you about yourself? Well, um, I am the daughter of Annie, Jimmy, and Lapolia Stewart. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a native Memphian. Mm -hmm. And uh, I pastored the church that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. I initially went to college to major in marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, and while working for Control Data Corporation as a sales uh, trainee and then moving to sales manager and later transitioning to work for Shelby State Community College as a director of admission, I was also called to the ministry. Mm -hmm. I did not expect that I would be um, pastoring, of course. Mm -hmm. I thought that because I was, for the most part, functioning as an itinerant bootlegging preacher mm -hmm. for about 11 years before mm -hmm. I accepted the call to ministry, that I would do that. I would work in higher ed and, um, you know, just preach, do revivals, and um, make that a secondary type of vocation. But my pastor had a massive heart attack in a Bunton's restaurant mm. in 1994. Mm. And to my surprise, even though I was raised and nurtured in a denomination, Baptist denomination, that, that did not typically um, see women as being eligible or even call to preach or pastor, uh, our church called me to pastor the church in March of 1995. I was elected in March of 95. So the last 23 years of my life have been spent uh, leading uh, the Congregation of Christ Missionary Baptist Church. I really thought that I was, my life would go in a different direction. I never would have anticipated that I'd be pastoring. I do remember saying that I wanted to work in ministry full time, but I had no idea uh, that I would be pastoring. So, and I also have one sister um, and a brother and another sister, um, Lorraine, Dwight, and Maria. And I'm single with no dependents. Mm, wow, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I want you to back up a minute. Go all the way back to the call. Tell me about your call. My call was rather interesting because I, as I said earlier, I actually started speaking in church when I was about 18 years old. We had a youth day celebration and that particular Sunday I was given the assignment of uh, extending the welcome and the occasion. And so I wrote a speech, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and the speech turned into a little sermonette. <laughs> so <laughs> you know how we do it, yeah, that, we do. you know, Baptist preachers. Yeah. Yeah. And so my pastor said next year, you will be the youth day speaker wow. and Carla, his daughter, will be the, well, you will speak in the evening, Carla will speak in the morning. And so, you know, a year passed and, and that's exactly what happened. From that, members of our church started talking to their friends saying, there's this young girl that goes to our church and she's she not a preacher, but she talks, she, she speaks like a preacher. Mm -hmm. And so people started inviting me to speak at different churches. Wow. And from that, I started, you know, doing, Women Days, Youth Days, 
I was in those days, mistresses of ceremonies yeah. were really, really, really right. popular. Right. Right. And so I spent a season also uh, narrating for a community choir, the Angelic Voices of Faith. And actually when I would narrate for them, I was doing many sermons too. Right. Right. And my pastor would always say to me, you know, when are you coming to talk to me about, <laughs> about preaching? Right. And of course there were really no models in terms of women preachers in terms of my experience and my upbringing. But thankfully, I had a pastor who believed that God could use women. Mm -hmm. And so he never had any issues or objections to even the thought of being called. In fact, he would bring it up more than I would. And he would always say, well, whenever you get ready, just let me know. Mm -hmm. And so finally, in 19, 1989, I believe I really initially heard a call as we experienced it in 1986. Mm -hmm. I was leaving my parents' house and I know that it was the voice of God. Mm -hmm. It was a heart impression, but it was a voice of God that was so strong that I began to cry. Mm -hmm. And I sensed God calling me into the ministry, but the fear of it and as well as my desire uh, and my fear of never getting married because I was thinking if I if I accept a call to ministry I never get a husband mm -hmm. and so I was like okay we're gonna negotiate this right <laughs> let's negotiate this God I'm gonna do this and I'll I'll speak and but I won't accept a call to ministry and so I, I pushed it out of my mind for about three years but in the year of 1989 from January until December mm -hmm. there was this persistence that I could not shake. You know, I didn't see a light, I didn't see a burning bush, I didn't see myself in a standing before crowds speaking, but there was this nagging persistence that I could not shake. And so I committed, committed it to prayer and uh, finally uh, began to talk to my, talk to my parents about it first and then I talked to some of my friends because you think about all of these things when you're really considering contemplating, at least I was, contemplating a call to preach. How will my friends act? You know, what, what will the members at the church say? How will I be received? What is this going to mean for my future as a female and all of this? Mm -hmm. And uh, of course the Lord won. Mm -hmm. And so the last Sunday in December of 1989, I went to service I went to church before service started, and I told my pastor that I felt like I was being called to ministry. Mm -hmm. And he said, I was wondering what took you so long. <laughs> <laughs> and then he told me, he said, you'll never rest mm -hmm. until you say yes. Yeah, wow. And so that was really the beginning of my journey officially with ministry. But 11 years prior to that, I had already been doing devotions, speaking in churches, um, narrating for concerts. Mm -hmm. So technically, uh, I guess you could say, I've really been preaching <laughs> officially almost 30 years, mm -hmm. but unofficially maybe more like 41. Wow. Wow. All my life, pretty wow. much. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Were there um, models that you could see? You know, I, I've thought about that often, and honestly, my first preaching models were two women who really weren't preachers, mm -hmm. officially. Mm -hmm. If they, if they, I think if they had come along in a different time, in a different season, they probably would have been preachers. They were definitely preachers, but they called themselves reachers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of them was a lady by the name of Archie Mae Pratcher. Mm -hmm. She was a member of Middle Baptist Church, pastor by uh, Dr. Benjamin Hooks. And the other was a lady named a lady named uh, Nancy Gavans. Mm. And one of the things that I gleaned from them primarily was not so much in terms of style or even structure, but just the confidence. I think that what they did for me as a, as a young girl, because you know I was 18 years old and most of my models had been, most of the models in terms of preaching that I had heard who came through our church, <coughs> excuse me, for the most part had been male. Mm. But I think they helped me to sort of find my voice, if you will, mm -hmm. as a female. And so while they were not necessarily trained as preachers, they were not even, they didn't even acknowledge a call as preachers. If you heard them, you could hear there was a preacher mm -hmm. in that, in that bodysuit. And so I think, I would say that they were really the first quote unquote models of women preachers that I saw. Now growing up, um, 
Derek King, who is who is also a relative of mine, uh, our, my pastor used to invite him to come and preach at our church. So. Commonly, D. E. King. D. E. King. Yeah, I'm, right. Saying, right, I'm sorry. Right. No, no, no. Yeah. You did fine. You, you, right. you, you, it's part of your family. That's so, right. Because right, right, right. we're, we're cousins, but D. E. King, mm -hmm. and so he would do revivals for us, and of course, Reverend Clay Evans was related to my pastor, and he would always do revivals for us. But in terms of preaching models, my models and mentors for a long time in ministry were books. Mm -hmm. I met this guy named Danny Thomas uh, in the early years when I was speaking and doing devotions and doing MC and all that. And he, he said to me one Sunday after I had uh, done a devotion or MC the program. He said, you need to be heard. Mm -hmm. He said, God has gifted you and you need to be heard. And I never, and now Danny was a lay person actually, but he really loved God. He's still living. And he introduced me to Cokesbury Bookstore. Mm -hmm. It used to be on, over on Perkins Extended and we went over there and I've always been a, a voracious reader. Mm -hmm. And so I went in Cokesbury and I just really fell in love with all these books. And to this day, I still love to read. Mm -hmm not just, you know, religious books, but I like to read deep and wide. And so for a long time, my mentors were books. And then one year, my pastor invited Shirley Prince hmm. to preach at our church. And I was just struck by her preaching gift, her depth, um, her confidence, her boldness in proclamation. And we later became really good friends. And so she became like a friend and a mentor to me not only in terms of her preaching, but also in terms of ministry. Uh, particularly after my pastor died, uh, I learned so much from her. So I would say she was probably one of the first, other than my pastor uh, and, and Archie Mae Pratcher, as well as uh, Nancy Gavans, who sort of gave me an idea of how a woman ought to conduct herself in terms of public proclamation and public speech. And then of course, Reverend Shirley Prince. Mm -hmm. And then, as, and then after Shirley, through Shirley, I began to meet other people mm -hmm. because Shirley would always talk about, uh, you need to meet Renita. Mm -hmm. and she was talking about Renita Weems. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and of course, I did not know her personally, but I became acquainted with her ministry through Shirley Prince. And then later, in later years, uh, I actually became acquainted with Dr. Weems and then I met other women. And so as time evolved, um, God began to allow my paths to cross with other women uh, who helped to shape and form my preaching. Okay, okay. So how do you prepare a sermon? <laughs> I'm always asked this question. Mm -hmm. And so the irony of that, that question, the irony of the answer I should say is that while I am a very uh, structured person in terms of the way I learn, you know this, mm -hmm. you know, I, I consider myself to be concrete sequential. Yeah. And so I like everything step by step, but I'm very eclectic mm -hmm. in terms of the way I prepare to preach. And I think that one of the reasons why I'm like that, I finally discovered a descriptor uh, that explains my preaching preparation style. In the book, um, Preaching with Power, I think Dr. Uh, LaRue is the editor for that. Alice Burgey Bryant, we'll let Alice Burgey Bryant talks about the difference between a surfer and a sergeant. Mm. And she basically says that a, sur a sergeant is the type of person who has a structured routine. The surfer moves according to a rhythmic and creative pattern. Mm. And that's really the way that I, that I, that I start to prepare my sermons. It's, it's bathed really in prayer. And so in many instances, my, my sermons arise more out of life-led experiences than text-led experiences. Although I can um, read a text and, and find inspiration for preaching. For the most part though, I, I would say I'm a student of, of the word and scripture, of, of the word and culture. And so I, I think about ideas when I'm preaching. Um, and because uh, I have a deep commitment to um, social justice and prophetic ministry. Uh, I'm often thinking about what's going on culturally. And so oftentimes I'm thinking about that when I'm preparing, pre preparing the sermons to preach. And as a pastor, I'm always exegeting the congregation. I'm thinking about what is happening with those persons who sit in the pew. 
not just in terms of what they're hap what's happening with them existentially, but I'm thinking about the different age groups that I'm talking to uh, with the intent of trying to reach, reach them as well. So I would say it starts with meditation and uh, it's bathed in prayer and then from meditation it goes to you know observation and interpretation because I read all kinds of periodicals. I'm always looking for ideas because I think it's important to connect with the audience. And then once I land, with, land on an idea or a scripture that really grabs me, then I start with my uh, interpretation, which is the exegesis. And then from interpretation is application. And from application, you know, we pray to God for transformation. <laughs> so <laughs> I am a, what I would call a student of the new homiletic though. When I, when, I, when, when I enrolled in seminary, um, much of the preaching classes or much of the books that, m most of the books I should say, that our preaching professors recommended to us were books by uh, Eugene, uh, Eugene Lowry, Fred Craddock, uh, and of course Henry Mitchell. And so, and I was already preaching that way anyway, but I learned some of the other skills in terms of narrative, the way narrative preaching works inductive preaching using RLEs or real life experiences to introduce uh, sermonic uh, uh, thoughts and introduce sermons. So do you prepare a manuscript? Oh yes, yes. I, I always prepare a manuscript. I can preach without a manuscript, but um, I've just always written my sermons out. Uh, and, 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 and even though I can be spontaneous, because I'm struck, I'm a concrete sequential, mm. and I don't want to miss anything and leave anything out. Right. I have a tendency to rely on my manuscript, but I'm not tied to it. You know, you, most of the time, I try to prepare my sermons well enough in advance so that I've internalized it, mm. so that if the iPad decides to go out mm. <laughs> or the computer decides to act crazy or whatever, I still have it in here. But I typically do. I always write my sermons, write them out completely. I don't use outlines. So you're sitting, you're preaching with a live <clears throat> manuscript, well, with the manuscript. So how much of what you say on average is not on that manuscript? Ooh, that, that's, that's a difficult question to answer. I'm not sure. I would say probably 30 to 40 percent. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm which is probably one of the reasons why my sermons are a bit lengthy, <laughs> mm -hmm. because when I'm in that moment preaching, there's always some other idea that comes to me as I'm preaching, right. you know? And so I may, I may have the idea in the manuscript, but in that moment while I'm preaching, another idea might come to me spontaneously, right. and I'll insert that or inject that. So I would say probably 30 to 40% of it. And I ask you that because, you know, it's often presented as an either or. So right. Either you're tied to the manuscript or you're, you know, you're flying free, you know, mm -hmm. you're composing freely. And I think there's a middle ground. And the middle ground is there's a manuscript, but you're not tied to it. Right. And, you know, as you say, and what that means is there's a tremendous amount of freedom and the manuscript provides the structure so you don't get too far out right. there. But, you know, you've already concrete sequential, you've already laid the basic right. structure out. <laughs> And, and I believe, too, that a sermon is always in process. Yeah. You know, I believe that we are constantly revising. I think that, you know, it, it is, even at its best, it's still a draft. Right. Uh, because I'm one of these, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are probably others that feel this way, too. Uh, you know, after I preach a sermon, like, I should have said that. Right, or, I, yeah. I thought about that. <laughs> you know, and sometimes it comes in the preaching moment. And then there are other times that I think about another thought or another insight that I could have inserted here or added here. And so the sermon is always up for revision. Right. So if we were to ask you, given some of the traditional categories like expository or narrative or womanist, how would you, how would, do you fit in any of those categories, hybrid, how would you? I think that uh, without a doubt, I'm narrative. Okay. But I also think that um, I preach in three voices. And I, I found this, I discovered this thanks to this program because you're, you're forcing us <laughs> to really think about <laughs> these things that we've been doing. <laughs> but I appreciate it because we do preach all the time, but we don't think about the theory behind what we do. And so 
while writing a paper uh, for one of our classes, I believe, homiletic, homiletical theory, I was reading a book by Dr. Um, Kenyatta Gilbert, The Journey to African American Preaching, and he lifted up uh, this journey and promise of journey and promise of Africa. Let me get it right. right. <laughs> Let me get it right. Journey and promise. I only did it because it means somebody who wants to order. Right. It. They might want to order that book. Right. Journey and promise of African American preaching, and he lifted up this trivocal homiletic, yeah. and he talked about prophet, priest, and sage. And when I read that, I thought that in many ways I feel that I preach in three voices. Mm -hmm. I preach. My one voice is pastoral because that's primarily where I spend the majority of my time. And so I'm always thinking about congregational issues, issues of spiritual disciplines, transformation, uh, stewardship, grow, personal growth, uh, and all those kinds of things that are related to uh, transforming lives. And then, of course, there's this, as I mentioned earlier, this commitment to social justice in my preaching or prophetic commitment in my preaching, which deals with the realities of finite disappointment. But in preaching, I'm always trying to construct this alternative future. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, because I'm female and because I have experienced so much as a woman in ministry, I believe that there's also a womanist lens that informs and shapes my preaching, which is committed to uh, preaching liberation to all people, but certainly as the situation warrants and as the text should warrant or as the context should warrant, uh, dealing with issues of racism and oppression and other uh, issues that tend to create bias against certain populations. So I would say that you know, I preach in three voices, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I call it a trivocal womanist. Homiletic. All right, now I know Kenyatta <laughs> Gilbert is shouting right now. <laughs> Let's hope so, anyway. <laughs> Let's hope so. I'm gonna send it to him to make sure he gets right. a shout in. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's a great book, though. It is. It really yeah, is. It's a really, it really great is. book. And he's great people. And yes. Now, so tell me about uh, a time that was very difficult for you to preach. That could be a personal time, something in your personal life. It could be community, or it could be something in the church. I ask this question, give you the context of why I ask this question is that, you know, people see preachers such as yourself as up here, you know, celebrate you and don't know the story. Right. That, you know, every preacher has at some point all that melts away and you stand in there because standing there is the only thing you can do. <laughs> right. So give me a time that, that it was tremendously difficult and you, you had to, to stand. I can give you several, but. <laughs> well, I'll take them, but, I'll, take but, them. Yeah, I'll take them. But the one that, that really, uh, I think the one that was probably one of the most difficult was when I had to preach for Hampton. <laughs> and I say that, and of course, you know, I'm always, on edge when I preach, right. you know, right. um, because I, I, I know that preaching, Dr. Gardner Taylor said preaching is a matter of life and death. And so I know that, you know, when I'm standing behind a sacred desk, it's not just a, a moment for me to shine or to be seen, but people's souls are at stake. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always approaching the sacred desk with fear and trepidation. but. Hampton trepidation, trepid, trepidation, but Hampton is a different animal because preaching to preachers is always challenging. Yes. And <clears throat> excuse me, you hear all these, you know, stories. That you don't want to die before you go before you preach at Hampton. And then, of course, when people find out you're preaching, they say, "Well, I don't know whether to congratulate you or to give you my condolences." <laughs> And so, you know, it's, it's, it's very intimidating. It's very intimidating. Uh, you hear all the horror stories. You hear, you know, you don't want to die when you go to Hampton and all these kinds of things. And so I would say that preaching at Hampton was probably one of the most intimidating experiences because when the word is out that you're preaching at Hampton, everywhere you go, you ready for Hampton. <laughs> you ready for Hampton. And I'm saying to people, you know what, I have several other places that I have to preach before I get to Hampton, but I'm praying that I'll be ready. But I'll tell you what, hap what helped me the first time I preached. I was 
getting ready to go to the worship center and I happened to listen to my voicemail and Ralph West mm. left the message on my voicemail. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, Gina, do what you do when you're at home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you do what you do when you're at home, you'll be fine. Yeah. And I felt a peace after I, after I received that message. And of course the experience was not nearly as, as bad as I expected or as difficult as I expected. The audience was warm and inviting and especially in the morning, I felt that they really came for church. Right. So, it, 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 but it was, it was really probably one of the most difficult in anticipation of that moment, right. yeah. So some of our uh, viewers may not know what the Hampton Menaces Conference is, so would you just give a brief summary of what is the Hampton <laughs> Menaces Conference? Well, the Hampton Menaces Conference meets every year annually in June. It's a wonderful conference. It's a conference where you have some of, I would say, some of the best and some of the brightest uh, who come to preach. Um, there's lectures, there's lectures, there's music, there's preaching, and of course there are classes, there's a woman in ministry session, but it is considered to be one of the premier stages. Uh, I guess you would st say it still is, but in the, in, at that particular time it was considered to be one of the premier stages for preaching uh, or for preachers. Mm -hmm. And uh, to receive an invitation to preach at Hampton uh, was a signal honor. And I would say it probably still is a signal mm -hmm. honor. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course being a female, as well, mm -hmm. uh, because Hampton Hampton does have have women who preach, but particularly it is a stage where you've particularly, in particular, seen more male heard more male voices than female voices. Yes. So you were blessed and privileged to do it twice. Right. Once you were the morning preacher. Right. And once you were the evening preacher. Exactly. So let's spend a let's spend a minute on the night session preacher at Hampton. Okay. So set the stage. <laughs> for the night preacher at Hampton? The first night that I preached at Hampton, I was, I was afraid that the people would leave mm -hmm. because there was, I, I don't even remember who it was, but some speaker spoke before I did. Mm -hmm. And they were up, I, I know probably 30 to 45 minutes mm -hmm. before I came out and um, <laughs> some people would come back to the green room and, you're going to be all right. <laughs> I hope the folk don't leave before you get <laughs> so, so, you know, I'm a ball of nerves, right? <laughs> They're helping you, right? Right, they helping me. they encouraging me, <laughs> scaring me and encouraging me at the same time. But really, one of the things, for me, the preaching experience really wasn't much different than the morning. I had heard real horror stories about the night, yeah. night spot because... Uh, that's the spot where they would say, well, you know, they walk out on you at night. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking, I'm having nightmares about people just walking out in droves, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when you're preaching. But it really was not any, much different um, than the morning for me. I felt that I didn't feel the tension. I didn't feel, and even though there's always, you know, some tension, I guess, in audiences where preachers are listening to preachers, I still didn't feel, I didn't feel that pressure that I thought I would feel when I got up to preach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was not a bad experience. Good. Yeah, and I'm grateful to um, Billy Curtis and Dr. Billy Curtis and Bishop Claude Alexander who extended the invitation mm -hmm. uh, to preach both times. Billy extended the invitation when I preached in the morning and Alexander in the uh, evening. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, you did a wonderful job. I was there for Thank both. Thank you. I was well, there you for know, both we the preached kids. together what, the year that That's was, right. You were the morning preacher. That was, that was the, you were the night preacher. Right, so right. I, I, yeah. was, I was there both times. And you did a one a magnificent, outstanding job. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I have my own Hampton story, so <laughs> I won't go down that road because that is, you, you're, yeah. you're the third person that's been in, in this chair in the last two days this, that has talked about Hampton. Oh, wow. And uh, so... We'll talk about that later. Woo, Hampton. But that's, yeah, you were, you were a blessing. You were a blessing. Thank you. You, you, you were a blessing. Thank you. Let's go to the other side. When was there a time that you thought God really used you? You know, usually we do the modesty thing. As preachers, we know, you know, da, da, da. But uh, there is the side of us that I'm just thankful. God really used me today. So when, when, when might the time that be? There are a number of times in worship 
and sometimes they're not always preaching moments. Uh, this past Sunday, I felt that God really used me, and actually I wasn't preaching. I had received uh, a couple of inbox messages from members who were asking for prayer about specific situations. And so as I was pondering their request, because both of them attend our 10 o'clock service, and praying about it and thinking about where in our worship I would you know, call them up for prayer, I believe it was the Spirit that spoke to me and said, just, just call for prayer for people that might have special needs. And of course, I did, and, and you know, the rest is history. There was a, a great move of God in worship that day, uh, this past Sunday, and, and there was really no preaching. It was just obedience to the Spirit of God. But what really blessed me that, that day, because sometimes when you do those things in worship, when people are used to a certain structure and a certain format, you know, you know what you, you, I know what I believe I hear God saying, but I also know what it may feel like and look like to people who came for worship with different expectations. And I was, I had opened the doors of the church, extended the invitation to discipleship, and several people came up to unite with the church. I was about to lift the offering, and three of our young men mm. who work in media were coming down the aisle. Mm, mm, mm. Millennials. Wow. And they were coming down, two millennials and one teenager was coming down the aisle. And so they came down and requested prayer. And, uh, but as they were about to take them to the back, I said, keep them out here. I want us to pray for them as a congregation. While we were praying for them, another young man came up mm. and as we were praying, I could just see him breaking under the power of God, and we just began to pray and minister to him. Well, a few minutes later, another man came up and began to cry and pray, and he was just hugging him. Well, as it turned out, it was his son. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he had been praying for his son to come back to come back to, um, come back to the Lord. And it was just a great time of rejoicing, but I, I knew in that moment, when that happened, I knew in that moment, that God had used me because I had been obedient to what the Lord had instructed me to do in that particular moment. The other moment that I, that I believe that really comes to mind uh, about when God used me was also at Hampton, and this was at night. And this was the second night after I preached. I preached um, that Luke 13 passage. And when I sat down, I was thinking to myself, I said, I don't know if I made any sense or not tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, you know, looked up and I, you know, there, there's a section where some of the preachers sit in the section. And I looked up and Dr. Jeremiah Wright mm. was looking at me. Mm. And I could see nobody but him. And he was standing there with his finger, mm. giving me the thumbs up. Mm -hmm. And I just grabbed my towel <laughs> and started weeping. <laughs> Lost it. Huh? Right. <laughs> because, I mean, it just, I, don't, I can't even describe what that did for me in that moment. And of course, I, I think I must have sat there maybe five or 10 minutes just weeping. I mean, just literally weeping because to have a general like that, I'm about to weep now, mm -hmm. a general like that to, whew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To take a moment and just affirm what I had done mm -hmm. and, and to do that publicly just bless me. Mm -hmm. And of course, behind that, there was like just an afterglow mm -hmm. that swept through the center. And uh, finally, I left, you know, people started praising God. They started dancing and shouting and running around the worship center. And uh, I finally left and I got to my room and about, I'm, I don't know, it must have been maybe after 11 o'clock that night, one, I called one of my church members and I said, I was just checking to make sure that they um, made it back to the hotel. And they said, we're just getting back to the room. I said, from church? <laughs> <laughs> they said, Pastor, it was explosive. Mm -hmm. So I would say that that night when I saw, when he, it wasn't that I was looking for his affirmation, but it's like God used him mm -hmm. to let me know that God was pleased. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I will never forget that. So do you, um, I don't want to say prefer, there are some people who sit in this chair and say, do you prefer preaching on the road? Do you prefer preaching at home? 
And my question is a little deeper than that, but that's the best way I can articulate it. That is there a difference between preaching at home and preaching on the road? Or tell me about it. Just tell me that. I like both. Um, I, I love pastoring. Um, I love working with and ministering to people and seeing lives changed. I like that. But I also like preaching on the road as well. Um, I like b the exposure, to having the opportunity to be exposed to other ministries. And preaching on the road for me is not just about the invitation. It's also been about the relationships that God has uh, blessed me to, to nurture mm -hmm. and relationships that have developed. I have friends all over the country uh, really because of the invitations that I receive, and not just with the pastors, but with members of the congregation. Uh, and so that's really a gift and a blessing to me. Um, I, I, um, I can't say that I prefer one over the other. Yeah. I, I, really, I really like both. But, when, but one of the things that I think is different about preaching um, pastorally as opposed to preaching in, as an itinerant, is that when I preach pastorally, I'm preaching for the most part for transformation. I'm preaching to help members grow. I'm preaching um, to deal with issues of personal transformation and, and life, universal uh, human experiences. When I preach on the road, I, I typically preach for, tra preach for edification and exhortation because I'm not the pastor. I, I have the the perspective of a pastor. And I think that that probably comes through in my preaching, but I don't, I don't, I, I try to stay away from rebuking and correcting and all of that. And I, I tr try to lean toward exhortation and edification. Do you have a favorite sermon? Of my own? Mm -hmm. I, I guess I would say every year I have, a, uh, I have a favorite sermon, mm -hmm. um, but not really. No, I don't, I don't think, I, don't, I wouldn't say I have a faith. I, you know, I may, as I'm preaching during the year, there may be a particular sermon that I feel really makes an impact. It's very impactful, but I, I, I wouldn't say I have a favorite sermon. Do you have a favorite sermon um, by someone that you didn't preach? That it's not you, but a, another preacher that you might consider one of your favorite sermons? Um, I love listening to anything that Dr. Renita Weems preaches. But one of the sermons that really blessed me one year was the, uh, a sermon that she preached at the um, Proctor Conference called Not Yet. Mm -hmm. I think that's the name of it. Mm -hmm. It was the e Hebrews 11, yeah. uh, Living with Unfulfilled Faith or something like that. I, I can't get the exact title of it right, but it was, the scripture was about these all died in faith, mm -hmm. but, having, but not having received the promise. Yeah. And, you know, I, f I just felt like it was such a realistic sermon because so often, I've heard you say so often in, in sermons, we can lean toward over-promising and, and, and under-delivering, but it dealt with the reality that sometimes what you preach, you may not see it in your lifetime, yeah. but you don't preach it because it happened to you or because of your experience. You, be you preach it and you believe it because it's true. Right, right. I think we published that sermon in the uh, Preaching with Sacred Fire in, right. in the anthology. It's a powerful. It's a powerful sermon. It's yeah. Powerful, powerful, it's a powerful sermon. sermon. Yeah. Powerful sermon. Absolutely. Yes. So, uh, if you had to recommend some preaching books to our listening audience, um, now that you have this extensive <laughs> repertoire. <laughs> right. Thanks to the Reverend Dr. Frank Anthony Thomas. <laughs> that, you know, so any stand out to you, any that really you think, you know, somebody who's... I would say anything, well, all of your books, your preaching books are great. Um, and of course, one of them, one, one book that I would suggest is a, is a, should be a staple for any preacher is your book, um, They Like to Never Quit Praising God. Okay. Anyone who wants to know about structure and preaching, which I think is really critical in in preaching, you know, structure is your friend, I think. Uh, and so I think that they like to never quit praising God is one that every preacher should have in their uh, library. Also, The Certain Sound of the Trumpet mm -hmm. by uh, Dr. Um, Proctor. Sam Proctor is a great book. Um, 
I've read just about all of uh, Reverend Renita Weems' books. She, uh, but one of her books in particular that blessed me in the early years of my preaching was Just a Sister Away, yeah. giving that womanist lens. And Dr. Elaine Flake has a great book out too, also called uh, God in Her Midst, mm -hmm. that deals with preaching healing uh, to women. Mm -hmm and looks at preaching, not only does she give some theory and talks about what womanist preaching is, but she also has sample sermons in that book that I believe are, are extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. And then of course, you know, I mentioned uh, Dr. Kenyatta Gilbert's book, The Journey and Promise of African American Preaching uh, is a really good book. And Dr. Kim Johnson um, has a good book too, mm -hmm. called Proclaiming Pre proclaiming rhetoric or preaching rhetoric, proclaiming rhetoric, womanist rhetoric from the pulpit. I have to get the exact title of that, but it's a really good book too because it has theory, but she also uses uh, sermons as examples. Mm -hmm. That's a fabulous book. It's there. a wonderful book. We, we, we push it for her. Yeah. I um, want to talk about close, the close of the sermon, and you are very gifted in your clothes. So tell me about your thinking about your clothes. Specifically, what do you mean? Uh, you do it so well, <laughs> it's not accidental. <laughs> so which means you're intending something to happen. Um, it's not disconnected from the sermon. It's a part of the process. Mm -hmm. So the clothes is not the main focus of the sermon per se, mm -hmm. so that you sacrifice content up front to get there. Right. No, no, it's balanced. Mm -hmm. So all that says to me that you've been very intentional and done some thinking about the who, what, the why, and you do such a fabulous job. So I'm, I'm open to anything that you would uh, tell us about. I think that in general, um, when I'm closing the sermon, I'm always moving toward a motif of hope. Um, you know, one of the things you talk about in your book, Celebration and Experience, I'm sorry, not Celebration Experience of Preaching, but they like to never quit praising God in your structure. One of the, the uh, steps is celebration. And celebration is not always just a hoop, of course, and uh, um, people standing on their feet, but that people leave with an assurance, as you say, of God's grace. And so in terms of intention, I'm always thinking about not only trying to paint an alternative picture, but also giving people uh, what Dr. Paul Brown, one of my homiletics professors used to say, is giving them some grace at the end of the sermon. Now that doesn't always mean that people will leave shouting. It doesn't always mean that they will leave um, you know, standing on their feet, particularly at home, they may leave being called to the altar. Uh, they may leave being called to reflect on uh, some behavior or some pattern that needs to be changed. But I'm always trying to ensure that the close of the sermon is directly linked to the entire structure of the sermon so that it fits together as a compact and it's a whole. And so you know, I'm always trying to begin with the end in mind. Right. What is it that I really want people to leave here thinking or doing right. or both right. as a result of what they've heard? And so a lot of times the clothes, um, I may write the, the, the most, the, the body of the sermon, mm -hmm. but I may wait for a while before I do the clothes. Mm -hmm. And then I'll come back and finish that clothes up, finish that clothes, finalize the sermon. One of the most beautiful thing about your clothes is, is the the emotive freedom or the or the emotive release that um, you know it's this thing said if you don't believe it right the people know I mean how can you ask people to believe what you don't believe mm -hmm. but there's something about after you've done all of this beautiful work that you do and then you know you know I call you a daughter of thunder <laughs> you, so we talked about this many times you thunder and it's just it's just absolutely gorgeous so how do you come to the level of emotive release and freedom within yourself? Go ahead. I'm preaching to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to help yourself. I'm preaching to myself. I'm getting happy. <laughs> really, I mean, really, I, I believe what I preach. Mm -hmm. I really believe it. And so 
even though I'm preaching, really, I'm serious. I, I'm shouting while I'm writing it, I'm shouting while I preach it. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, I really believe what I'm preaching. And I can, I can sense, Reverend Joanne Browning always tells me, she says, I can always tell when you're, ready, when you're about to shift gears and you're preaching because your ears turn red. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start watching for that. <laughs> she said, your ears turn red. But I mean, there is, there is something going on inside of me as well when I'm preaching. And so it's not contrived. It's not something that I'm trying to work up an audience, so to speak. I am experiencing this as I am proclaiming it. And because, you know, I've lived long enough to know that some of this stuff that I'm, well, not some of this stuff, but I know this is true. You know, I know that there are, incidents in our lives that don't always, our experience doesn't always match what we preach. Mm -hmm. But I've lived long enough to have, to bear witness and to have testimony that what I'm saying is the truth. Wow. And so, you know, it just, it just kind of happens. I, I, I can't explain, I don't have a formula. I don't have a, you know, it, it just happens. It just, when I, when I know anything, by the time I get to the close of the sermon, I've, I've gone into another zone. Mm -hmm. But I've written it out first. Okay. Okay. But now not all of it is written. Right. Some of it is, a lot of it is actually spontaneous. Right. Right. Yeah, right. it's the Lord. That's all I can yeah. say, it's the Lord. <laughs> well, you know, you do, you do a wonderfully masterful job. And in, in, you know, when, as women began to gain access, it was always the issue of you know, our trying to find models or imitate, are we imitating a man? As mm -hmm. we thought, you have a very natural, it's natural to who you are. Yeah. It's natural to being a woman and yet it thunders. Yes. One of the things I always say to our preachers at our church is, you know, do not ever allow anybody to even try to force you into trying to preach like me or anybody else. Be yourself, but be your best self. And I think it's really important to find your voice and find your rhythm. Um, and of course, I think that comes over time, yeah. you know, and, and with experience and with opportunity. Right. So, of course, one of the great questions is why is it that Dr. Gina Stewart would go into a Ph.D. in preaching program? I mean, the, <laughs> I mean she don't need it. I mean, so so why? do this PhD program in preaching? Well, I, I believe that um, learning is a lifelong journey. Mm -hmm. I, I can't say that's original, but one of my members actually said that, Alicia Jones, and I, I affirm that learning is a lifelong journey and I'm a lifelong learner. I like learning. And so when I heard about this program, I was already intrigued by the idea of getting an a PhD in African American preaching. I wasn't sure if I really wanted to do it because I had the same thought that some people ask me, you know, why would you go and get another degree? You already have a D-Men and you've already been preaching all these years. But I, th I thought about it and as the opportunity presented itself, I, I was uh, captured by the idea of getting the theory to go with the practice. Yeah. You know, I know the practice of preaching but I didn't have the theory. And so I thought that having both would just be a wonderful combination and a beautiful marriage. Uh, and of course, it's turning out to be just that, having been in this program. And it's also um, equipping me to answer questions mm -hmm. to preachers that are asking me these questions. <laughs> Because it seems that now that I'm in this program, some of, these, some of the same questions that we're answering in class are questions that I'm answering mm. in class. But now when people ask me, I have the theoretical answer as well as the practical answer. Tell the audience <laughs> about the Philadelphia phone call. You called me from Philadelphia. Remember that? It was a Saturday morning mm -hmm. and it was, I can see you don't quite remember it. Oh, I was excited. Right, yeah, oh, right, yeah. right, so tell, yeah. tell me well, about <laughs> Because, you know, we had been doing all this work, you know, you had us working like Hebrew slaves. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so I was talking about you real bad, <laughs> behind your back, about doing this paper right. on theory. You know, you, you had us working on our preaching method. That's right. what it was. Right. Right. And I had just finished my paper. Right. I went to preach for this um, preaching, preaching association mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 
this was an association that was comprised primarily of men and women who pastored churches and people who were ministers at churches. The young woman who was um, my host asked me if I would be willing the next day, because my flight was leaving later that afternoon, she said, would you be willing to meet with a group of women, women preachers? I said, sure, you know, I'm thinking we're going to lunch and all of this. I get there, it's a preaching workshop. <laughs> and the first question they asked me was, tell us your preaching methodology. <laughs> I wanted to shout. <laughs> because I had worked on it on the paper. Right. And it was like, okay, God, all of this stuff is really coming together. You know, it's really beginning. And when I tell you, over the last year, I have had several experiences like that. Mm -hmm. So it just really affirms the work that you're doing. It affirms what this program means uh, for those of us who are looking to, you know, not only preach well, but also have the theory to back up that preaching. It's, it's much needed because people are asking these questions. People want to know, how do you prepare your sermons? What's your preaching methodology? You know, they want, they want to know that. They want to get, they know what they see, but they, it's like getting under the hood of a car. Exactly. They know what the car looks like, but they want to get behind the sermon. And it's a great joy to be able to explain that in ways and in terminology that people can understand. Tell me about your dissertation topic. Well, I'm doing my dissertation on Dr. Claudette Anderson Copeland, and I tentatively have uh, as a dissertation topic and focus uh, a, a womanist homiletic of healing. Mm. The preaching of Dr. Claudette Anderson Copeland, a womanist homiletic of healing. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, I know all this. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> I really do it for the men, for the audience. Really, right, right. You right. really got to shout. I see. Right. <laughs> I felt that. Yeah. Way down. Well, <laughs> Shunned up. Okay. Because she, she really does have a healing yeah, homiletic. Yeah, she does. Right. She does. You, it's, you, it's, you've named it. Yeah, it's, it's a dominant thread. Um, spiritual, primarily in terms of what I hear, spiritual and emotional. Right. You know, she, she has that, she's that, uh, she has that surgeon, surgeon persona and healing persona. So just in case there are people in the audience who, not, who have never heard of Preacher Don't, so let me just give us, say a little bit about her so that they, they'll, they'll look her up on YouTube from this, but they should know. Dr. Copeland? Yes. Oh, yeah. Dr. Claudette Anderson Copeland uh, served for, I guess, maybe 30 years as the co-pastor at uh, New Creation Christian Fellowship Church with her husband, Bishop David Michael Copeland. It was a ministry they founded, but she is also uh, a preaching phenom, as they say, uh, whose preaching ministry spans more than 40 years. Uh, and one of the things that I really like about Dr. Copeland is, is not just her preaching gift, but her breadth and her depth. Mm -hmm. We have this joke uh, whenever she gets up to preach. We said, that thing is deep. <laughs> <laughs> because she always takes you to that deep place, but she's also very, um, she, 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 she really, gets down beneath the surface. She doesn't deal with shallow issues, shallow and superficial issues in her preaching. She really deals with, with deep issues. And of course, that's one of the reasons why I'm, you know, considering as a topic, uh, the healing homiletic in her preaching, because I see that whenever she preaches, there's always some invitation to healing, right. whether it's emotional or mental or psychological or even spiritual, or maybe even physical, mm -hmm. but there's always that motif in her preaching. Well, thank you so very much. This has been just an awesome, an awesome interview. I am um, excited that, of course, you're in the program and doing so very well, and I do very much, of course, this is the affirmation of theory and practice that, mm -hmm. that moves together in you and what I hope moves together in uh, just so many preachers and we don't think about the theory we don't we do it but right. if somebody asks us how do you do that and the asking and the answering of that has to do with replication right so that others can get better mm -hmm. so that others can step their preaching up right and so i'm excited that you know you could sit at the plateau of where you are and crest on into the sunset but to make sure that there are people behind you both women and men yes. who get better and better because we really 
I mean, you know, the, the reign of God comes in the togetherness. Right. You know? No one church can That's right. bring it forward. There's got to be a bunch of churches. And right. so I want to thank you for the extra work that you're putting in. And uh, I can't wait to read more and more about the healing homiletic. Yeah. And I was also thinking, too, that this program, I think, is going to probably lead to more writing. Oh, tell me about African American that. scholarship yes. in terms of writing because when I think about the new homiletic for example you know most of the books that I wrote that I read were by Eugene Lowry, Fred Craddock and of course Henry Mitchell mm -hmm. but I think that this program is going to birth give birth to and and of course there are others you know I, I mentioned Kenyatta Gill but Lisa Thompson and others mm -hmm. uh, but I think that this program is also going to birth um, more writers and more African-American scholarship in theory. Yes. Because what we, we find a lot of books that have sermons in them. Right. But the theory, right. I think, is going to, we, we're going to really see more of that as more people graduate, more students graduate from this program. So any final word you'd like to say? I'm, I um, You've got tremendous experience, pastoral experience, preaching experience, scholarship experience, all this. Any, any um, any final word? I've asked you a lot of questions, but any any word that you want that's on your heart that I either haven't asked you about or anything's on your heart you would like to say? Um, I I guess the final thing that I would say there's so many things I would say could say, but one of the things that um, I really want to be a matter of public record is my appreciation for what you have done um, with this program, for the excitement that is generating. Uh, for what it's doing for myself as well as my cohort, our cohort, uh, not just in terms of what we're learning as preaching, but the community um, mm -hmm. that we formed as a cohort. And what this, this program is really going to mean to the church and to the world. Mm -hmm. I just think it's going to be a blessing. You said you believe that African-American preaching can uh, bring about a renaissance. I believe you're right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I believe that the times in which we live definitely call for it. Yep. So we, what we say, this is for everybody, what we say is that African-American preaching can generate a preaching renaissance yes. to revive American Christianity yes. in the 21st century. Yes. So thank you for that. I believe it in my heart, and I know you do too. And you've been a real blessing, and uh, we can't wait to hear more of your preaching. And, may I add, the books you're going to write. Hallelujah. <laughs> speaking prophetically over you. <laughs> Come on, prophet. Break some oil out, right? <laughs> but I mean it, you're gonna write some stuff. I hope so. You will, you will. I hope so. So I maybe a professor of preaching somewhere, someday. Oh, come on, prophesy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I already um, do an intensive. Yes, yes, well, I'm talking about your teaching ministry, so go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I already yeah. do an intensive every year at Virginia Union. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful to Dr. John Kenny, who extended the invitation uh, to be a part of the adjunct faculty at Virginia Union. And, and what I'm teaching is really a, um, like a practical theology class. Mm -hmm. But of course, it ne we never get out of the class without some preaching <laughs> <laughs> taking place. <laughs> but it's really been great to uh, have a chance to interact with the student body. And, and, and to be on an HBCU campus is really, really special too. So I, I do enjoy that. It's been great. I, I've also taught adjunct a couple of uh, semesters, two or three semesters at Memphis Theological Seminary as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that this degree will just. You got some more of it coming. Hey, yeah. You got more out of it coming. Right. All right. So thanks, sis. I appreciate Thank you. you so Thank much. You. Thank you. I appreciate you. Bless you.